Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to SuperCloud 5. This is day two, the battle for AI supremacy. Lisa Martin here with Savannah Peterson. We are live in Palo Alto. We've got our comrades live on the floor in Las Vegas. We had a great day one yesterday. Lots really of great did. takeaways. And one of them was really just from a thematic perspective. It's all about developer productivity and that AI as an easy button. Talk about some of the things because you had some, some great interactions with our guests who really kind of expanded upon that. Yes, thank you, Lisa. So excited to be here with you for day two of SuperCloud 5 and to have our remote team, John Furrier and Dave Vellante in Las Vegas at AWS reInvent. You know, I got to be honest with you, I, I kind of think of that Staples marketing campaign. Do you remember when they had that easy button? Yes. Yeah, and, and sometimes people would have them on their desk. Yeah. A random plug for Staples, I suppose. <laughs> but every time we have this come up in conversation, I see that button. And, and yes, it's an oversimplification of the amount of collaborative code that's being pulled together to build the foundation for our AI future. However, that is truly what this collaboration represents for folks who may not know how to write code for machine learning or a single line of code at all. If we can have creators and contributors to projects in the future that don't have to have the robust technical expertise that it's taken in the past and, and, and builders don't have to write that that code from scratch, that creates an entirely different creator ecosystem. I think about it as a, as a sandbox that we'll all be in, but instead of having to start and build the castle from scratch, we'll all have really cool molds and tools and things that help you get that foundation started and then add your little magic. I love that, that's a great analogy. Thank, thank you. I, I just came up with that. Maybe a side effect of living out on the beach. <laughs> uh, you know, we're always here for the fun metaphors, but, <laughs> but I, I think it's awesome. Balaji talked about it a lot. You know, Red Hat's really into developer productivity. Yes, They're working yes. with so many different partners to try and create the best offering for their customers. And I know that's something that you're really hot on. That's definitely a big theme of the show as well as that yeah. collaboration. Absolutely. What have you been hearing, Lisa? No, I think the collaboration was a theme. We also heard the CEO of MongoDB who was with John right. yesterday in Las Vegas talking about really kind of the ethos of, of MongoDB is to ease developer productivity, to make them faster so they can deliver products faster. But the collaboration fund is something that I, that I always love because, you know, we're here talking about the battle for AI supremacy, but collaboration, I'm sure we're going to hear more about it today. We heard a lot about it yesterday. It's all about vendors and organizations and customers and partners working together to meet the customer where they are, yeah. driven by what they want, and what they want is choice. It is what they want as choice. And you know, you mentioned a lot of the players there from startups to customers to hardware and software all coming together, enterprise as well as different size and scope. It's also governments. We saw just a few days ago that it looks like there were 18 countries just signed the first agreement about AI, been a big conversation about standardization, regulation, and figuring out where we're driving in that regard. Big hot debate, doomers versus the, the very bullish folk yeah. on the AI evolution. Actually curious what your hot take is, but I do think this is interesting. I mean, this is the first time multiple nations around the world have actually inked a document. Granted, it appears to just be general guidelines at this point okay. for monitoring abuse, protecting data, yeah. and vetting suppliers. However, these are the types of steps that I think we're going to see a lot more of. Yeah. And in the same way that companies of all different size and scope don't want to get left behind right now, I think the same thing is a geopolitical issue when it comes to different nations not wanting to get behind and also make sure that they're a part of the decision-making table yes. when it comes to architecting, uh, perhaps pun intended, architecting this potential future. Are there any collaborations, speaking of, that get you personally excited? Oh, gosh, so many. One of the things that I love about working with the big vendors and the small vendors is really hearing what customers are demanding and seeing the evolution yes. of technologies and companies based on them not being in a vacuum, developing 100%. products that they think, oh, this is great, this is the, fan, this is the, most, yeah. the best thing that's going to work the way we want it to. Not necessarily. Listening to your customers, I think, th that's the collaboration that I love. I, when all the clients that I have that I talk to, all the folks on the cube that we talk to, that's, that's a running theme. And if you're not doing that, and we know AWS is very much about putting the customer first and working backwards from there. Yeah. We also know all of the startup showcases that we've done, AWS's ecosystem has the same mentality, the same ethos. And I think it's the absolute right one to have is ensuring that the voice of the customer is, whether it's good or bad or indifferent, is driving 
the direction that you're going in because that's that's who's going to win this battle for AI supremacy is the is those vendors who are listening to their customers, putting them in the driver's seat and letting them take the technology in the right direction. Yeah, I think, I mean, community and, and voice of customer, two things you and I both love, Lisa. I think you bring up a really good point. Something to kind of build on that that's had me thinking this morning is I was doing some research on Jonathan Ross, who's going to be our next guest here on the show, uh, CEO and co-founder of Grok. He, he said recently in an interview that it's not just about solving the problems that people have today, like customers have today. It's actually about solving the unsolved problems yes. the, the, and answering questions that people don't yet have and getting ahead of that. I think that there's something to be said for also, as much as listening, anticipating and willing to place some bets. Yes, because that's the, a great point. The velocity of innovation right now, as we all talk about, is much faster than we've ever seen. Compute yes. power orders of magnitude faster than it's been historically. So therefore, yes, those, compu those customers are so vital to listen to. And at the same time, it's that fofu we were talking about yesterday, yes. that, feel, that fear of fudging up and, and worrying about, geez, well, not only do we need to make sure we're taking those big orders from big customers, we need to be anticipating where the market's going to be in just six to 12 months because it could be an entirely different arena. 12 months ago, last reInvent, we didn't even have chat GPT. Right, right. Here we are, super cloud five, talking about it, generative AI, definitely the conversation. You mentioned, actually speaking of, you mentioned you asked your eight ball. I did. I asked morning. my magic eight ball last night. Magic eight ball. I was very serious with this. Is generative AI going to be mentioned very serious? On the I appreciate show? that you are very serious oh, it's, about it's your. Not a toy. <laughs> it's not a toy. It's a tool. I love it. I love it. And I, sh I shook it, you know, lovingly as I do. And I said, <laughs> "Is generative AI going to be featured on the show today?" And it re <laughs> it wrote back with certainty. There was no reply hazy. Ask again later. Not sure. With certainty. And I went. That's why this tool is so powerful. It's right. It is right, and you know, I'm I'm curious how, and it probably was as fast as Grok's AI when you used it. You know, I cannot wait to see Grok's AI. I have heard nothing but amazing things from you because you got a sneak peek of it. I did. Super was wild in Denver. In it's Denver, true. and so you're not going to want to miss our, our our first guest in studio. It's coming up next. Grok, the CEO that Savannah spoke with at Supercomputing just a couple weeks ago. This demo is going to blow your minds. The, there's there's going to be amazing words that that come to mine, but I cannot wait to see it. And Savannah has something special planned, so you're definitely going to want to watch this. What are you excited about to hear it's from gonna be, It's going to be a cube first uh, in terms of the surprise. We've certainly never quite had had this level of experience, but you know me always trying to bring a little spice and a little silly yes, you do. to our wonderfully sophisticated conversations about technology. I'm. I'm really excited because Jonathan and Grok represent challenger brands in the AI space. There are a lot of enterprise household names that we're all familiar with that have been leaders in enterprise tech for decades. I think, and a lot of folks that we've spoken to that are smarter than I am on the show recently also agree that it's gonna, there's gonna be some new players yeah. in this space. And I believe that Grok is one of those players. I'm excited for Jonathan to tell us and actually show us a bit more about how they're gonna be one of those core players. Yeah. And, and I'm also excited to talk about the details of things. When we think about something being cheaper or something being faster, we think about it as, as almost a linear axis. We've got mm -hmm. to either reduce cost in, in the bomb or we've got to find a way to compute at the same time in different locations or whatever that is. But we seldom think about that as a complete architecture. That's right. It's very rare that we can affect three different axes of cost mm -hmm. at the same time. And that's exactly what Grok's doing. So I'm very excited to, to really get into the nerdy layers of inference and understand how their manufacturing here on our soil is going to position them in a way that's both competitive from a compute perspective and almost undeniably a, a strong player against some of the largest yeah. at scale companies, but also puts them in a really strong supply chain position by fabbing and creating those chips here on American soil. I love that. And I love that you bring up they're a challenger brand. Those are always, I think, exciting to talk to because you get the people that are- Low key, kind of my favorite. I yeah. know. They're authentic, they're genuine, they're working hard, and they probably have the right balance as we were talking about earlier in terms of mm -hmm. listening to customers and also being able to forecast and anticipate where things are going. What are the questions we're going to have? You brought up a great point that at reInvent last year, AI yeah. was obviously part of the conversation, but when ChatGPT was launched, like during that same week, I believe, 
and it accelerated everything in the last year. Nobody wants to get left behind, but there's so much that we don't know yet. And so being able to balance oh, yeah. the Still very blue sky. demands, this is what we want right now with anticipating where things are going and what kind of questions we might have in the near term future is I think where those challengers can really accelerate. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if we wanna, building on that, we look at November 30th, 2022, OpenAI announces ChatGPT. Everyone knows OpenAI is actually a nonprofit company. They've they've branched off to have a for-profit arm, a actually capped profit arm, as they call it, a capped profit company. One year ago, almost exactly to the day, actually one year ago, exactly, 365 days ago, this company would have had no visible valuation to most of us. I'm sure they were valued to some degree to their board and investors. Their valuation now today is sitting between 80 and $86 billion. Now, I'm curious, Lisa, do you know any other not-for-profits valued at $86 billion? I, you know, surely I can't think of one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, me neither. And, and I think it's really remarkable. It goes to show you what's possible so quickly now. The notion of any company, whether they be not-for-profit or for-profit, going from essentially zero to $86 billion wow. in a 12 12 month span yeah. is warp speed. Yeah. And, and speed is definitely going to be a theme of the show today. I am so excited to see some very speedy things. I can't wait to hear from John and Dave down in Las Vegas yes. working hard and talking to folks there at the show floor at AWS reInvent. And I'm really curious to get some advice from some of our guests. One of the last things I'll bring up today is I'm excited to chat with Jonathan a bit about his advice for other founders. Because yes. we are in this per year conversation and Balaji was saying yesterday, you know, we're, we're, we're optimizing developer productivity. We're also creating compute that can do things so much faster and more efficiently, hopefully building an, uh, an AI for sustainable world essentially. But beyond that, there's going to be new players in the game and not just new tech entrepreneurs and traditional folks that way. But like we talked about at supercomputing, we're going to be able to let researchers research. Yes. And the AI engine behind that will do will do the heavy lift on on the mathematical side. Then we're going to be able to let artists create, perhaps. And then the AI is going to help them fabricate their textile or whatever that might be. And we're going to let doctors heal and the AI will help them with predictive medicine or being able to not just detect but prevent bad things from happening, both from a fraud perspective and everything else. And, and so I'm curious to see what our guests have to say about that. I also want to just tie it back to something very insightful you said a moment ago when you were talking about the players at the front. You were talking about the customers. You and I both love that dialogue a lot. You mentioned that there's, there's some different people pushing at the front door right now. Yeah. And when we think about bleeding edge technology and the applications thereof, we often think of science, we think mm -hmm. of software, we think of, of, of fintech and things like that. We're, we're seeing banks, big banks coming to the customers that we're talking about. We're, we're seeing very traditional institutions, governments, I folks wanting to enhance their security as well as their, again, going back to that, that prevention, not just detection, that can save companies billions of dollars and also keep their customers' privacy safe. So I think it's gonna be absolutely fascinating. What do you think we won't hear much about today on the show oh, that's been a theme of the four super clouds that we've had previously? You know, I think one of the things that I appreciate about the Cube and the super cloud franchise, if you will, and, and those folks that we work with in tech on a daily basis, whether they're the, the big vendors or the challenger vendors, is really, we get to hear all of the positive outcomes. You mentioned some you know, banking companies that are becoming technology companies that do banking with yeah. smart fraud detection, really FinTech driven by technology to meet the consumers and the enterprise demands. But we get to hear the positive stories about healthcare, what it's allowing, to your point, letting physicians heal, letting artists create. And so I think there's, I, I was, I think I was telling you about this yesterday. I feel in tech, we have kind of a sense of obligation to help to, on the, even on the consumer side, help them yeah. understand that it's not just all the fear factor that you hear in the mainstream media. Seriously. That's all it is. Yeah. So all of my friends are terrified every time they see a post where I'm talking about AI. I'm like, well, we can talk about ethics in AI. We can talk about healthcare in AI. We can talk about so many applications. Did you check the weather today? Yes, I did. Cause that's AI. It is. 
So it was raining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose if you walked outside in the Bay Area, yes, you got a little bit of a sprinkle, and that was quite <laughs> yes. the forecast. But I do. I, I mean, we, you know, folks are afraid of the Skynet version yes. of yes. the hype here, and I think what it really is is fear of the unknown and fear of losing control. Yes. The reality is empathy. Uh, uh, empathy could be one of the outcomes that comes from Absolutely. AI. If we learn more about other people in other places and other cultures, then uh, without having to leave our our chair for example, through our laptop or whatever that, or a VR headset, for example, we can create that cross-cultural understanding yeah. that traditionally only happens when you go visit a place, yes. as an example, and or when you have a conversation with someone who has an alternative perspective. Yeah. So I think, yeah, granted, we're a bit biased. We get to talk to some of the coolest people yes. about one of the hottest yes. topics yes. of 2023 with yeah. some consistency. But like you, I think I'm optimistic. Yeah. And, and I think it's just going to be... A continuation of a wonderful dialogue that we've continued to have. You know, it's it is, but it's also I think something that that's important. But what you just said and what we're talking about right now, the security front and the having confidence in AI. I would love to be able to, to understand yeah. from Brock's perspective. You know, we talk about hallucinations. Uh, I was I was on the Cube uh, AI.com yesterday, and this is mm -hmm. funny. You and I were were live yesterday, and and I was I was sharing what the Cube AI the Cube AI.com's uh, definition of supercloud was, mm -hmm. and I, I searched within minutes. Uh, what does Lisa Martin think of supercloud? And there it popped up. What I had just said. I was. It was impressive. I, I witnessed it myself. It was fast. It and was impressive. The cubeai.com did not pay us to say that. They did not. <laughs> so if you have if you haven't been checking out, this is out of beta. The cubeai.com. Check it out. This is based on ten years of. It, of historical information from IT decision makers, leaders. It learns from our interviews, Absolutely. which is fantastic. And that also is. what I love, you put this out yesterday, it actually will, if I, when I typed in, what does Lisa Martin think of SuperCloud? Or I could do the same thing with, with Savannah or John or Dave or, or anybody guest. Um, it pops up clips, relevant clips that mm -hmm. are where you're actually talking about that. So you get the video content, you get the written content and it's receipts. It is. It's receipts for all of the fantastic thought leadership that we have on the show, all yeah. of the brilliant insights from co-hosts like you. And it's going to continue to populate all day while we have our fabulous guests both here in the studio in Palo Alto and it Las is. Vegas. I can't wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be playing around with it on our breaks. We're excited for you guys to see and spend the day with us for Super Compute, Super Cloud, sorry. <laughs> Speaking of Super Compute, we were just there. We're to blame, Cloud we're to blame for that, Lisa. Yeah, SC, SC, SC. And we're gonna have a great lineup of guests. We're gonna be talking with AWS experts, continuing to talk with customers and vendors and partners. But up next, the CEO of Grok, Jonathan Ross is here. You are not gonna wanna miss seeing Grok AI in action and a special something from our Savvy Sav. We'll see you in a minute.